welcome to our global audience. You can also ask questions or comment through social media using our hashtag IPU or hashtag democracy day. Let me start off with some practical questions. We have interpretation available in four languages. If you would like to ask a question, make a comment, put your question in the Q&A function on Zoom. Today, the big question is, has this declaration stood the test of time? We are in a situation of democratic backsliding where democracies are threatened by corruption, populism, autocracy and fake news. Here to discuss this, we have the honor to welcome five panelists. Four are here with me in Geneva and one is online. <clears throat> Let me start with Dr. Hanafi al Gevali, Speaker of the House of Representatives in Egypt. He previously served as Attorney General and Chief Justice of the Supreme Constitutional Court. Also, we have Mrs. Corinne Momal Vanian, Executive Director of the Kofi Annan Foundation. She has held several senior positions for the United Nations and worked six years in the Executive Office of the Secretary General. Also to my side here, I have uh, Mrs. Hand Abdalrahman Al Mufta. Welcome, permanent representative of Qatar to the United Nations office in Geneva. She's also appointed member of the Shura Council of Qatar in 2017, one of four women joining the council for the first time. Also welcome Mr. Martin Chungong, IPU Secretary General, who was recently elected to a third term he has had more than four decades of experience of parliaments at national and international levels. I also welcome Mr. Duarte Pacheco, elected IPU president in 2021. He has been a member of the parliament in Portugal since 1991. He is now joining us online from Kazakhstan. Mr. Pacheco, you have the floor for the opening remarks. we have Mr. Pacheco. He's going to unmute. <laughs> Hi. Are you, I am online now? Yes, you are. Please go Thank ahead. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to join you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Madam Ambassador, uh, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to join you in this uh, IPU hybrid event. And I am real happy to join you during this day, a happy day, International Day of Democracy. And 15th of September is uh, always important to commemorate uh, democracy. And so it is important day to the IPU. Allow me, to, uh, Mr. Speaker, to apologize because this event, uh, as we are commemorating 25 years of the of the our declaration day, should happen in Cairo, in person, because 25 years is a date that also in our lives is a special moment, and so it should happen in Cairo, but uh, it was not possible, and unfortunately because I am here in Nur Sultan to commemorate uh, in one special event that joined uh, religious leaders across the world that are together to build a better world, a safer world. I am not in person here to shake hands with you and to commemorate in Geneva this moment. So apologize, Mr. Speaker, because you are a special person and I would like to be with you very soon in person again. And uh, as I said, the declaration of this day as uh, Democracy Day happened 25 years ago in Cairo uh, after uh, Inter-Parliamentary Council that happened there, 1997. We had 
spent a few days, a few years after the end of the of the Berlin Wall, and a lot of new democracies are rising in our world. And people are very happy on that time. And so uh, it was decided that we needed to commemorate this day. And because, why? Why? Because democracy is the best political regime we may have. With democracy, the people are free to choose their de destiny. With democracy, everyone knows that we will have free press. Everyone knows that we have separation of powers between legislative, executive, but also the justice power it will be independent because we, we will understand that we will have a rule of law. We understand that uh, human rights will be defended. Democracy is not perfect. It isn't. There always is possible to improve. Yes, it is. Uh, we have a new challenge in all democracies, older or newer. Yes, we have. Because, for instance, how we may say that democracy, for instance, in countries with uh, some decades or centuries, are completely perfect when we see that uh, in many cases, 40, 50% of the population decides to abstain. It means that this, these democracies has problems too. And also, we have a new challenge. We have a new challenge. The social media, for instance, when attacks against institutions may happen and they may destroy all of us that try to preserve democracy and democracy representative. So we have a lot of challenge. We have a lot of things to do, but we will we continue to believe that there is no better political system. And that's why we need to commemorate it. And we need to commemorate it because sometimes people, essential the new generation, will feel that democracy and the freedoms will be there forever. Forgive me, this is not true. Democracy is like a flower. We need to give water every day. Otherwise, one day we will wake up and the flower is not there because died. So we need to continue this work to defend democracy. And IPU, as we have in our flag, as you have behind you, democracy for everyone is one of our values. This, this is why it's so important to defend it every day in our lives. That's why it's so important to commemorate this 25th year of our declaration. And if I may, yes, it's something that is important to do it also now in, during these days of so many turbulence in our world. Thank you for your attention. I believe that the new strategy that we approved will continue to defend democracy in our countries, in our world. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, it's so important to have your presence here with us. And so it's an honor for me, not just a pleasure, it's an honor for me to give the flower to our guest, to the Speaker of the House of Representatives of Egypt, Dr. Ali Tebali, a Democrat, a person that always defends the state of law. And that's why everyone in Egypt, but across the world, respect him so much. Thank you for your attention, Mr. Speaker. The stage is yours.
Thank you very much. I appreciate today being with you. And I appreciate the words of Mr. Duarte Bachiko, the president of IPU. And in this occasion of 25 years of issuing the Universal Declaration of Democracy in my country, Egypt, I have the pleasure to introduce my words in my mother language in Arabic. Ma'ali Sayyid Duarte Bachiko, Rais al Ittihad al Barlamani al Dawli. Ma'ali Sayyid Martin Shongong, al Amin al Amli al Ittihad al Barlamani al Dawli. Al Sayyidat wa Sad al Musharikin al Hudur al Karim. Yusuduni fi Mustahella Hadithi ilaykum an Uariba an Azim at Tizazi Bugudi Bainakum fi Makar al Ittihad al Barlamani al Dawli. محفلنا البرلماني العالمي المرموق والذي يجسد تاريخا طويلا من الحراك والتعاون البرلماني الدولي إزاء العديد من القضايا العالمية وفي مقدمتها نشر وتعزيز السلام وترسيخ الديمقراطية النيابية عن طريق تعزيز قنوات التواصل والتنسيق وتبادل الخبرات بين البرلماني البرلمانات والبرلمانيين من شتى الدول وهو ما جعل من الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي حاضنة عالمية لتطلعات وأمال شعوبنا جميعا والتي ترنو إلى السلام والأمن والاستقرار والرخاء السيدات والسادة الحضور لقد جسد الإعلان العالمي للديمقراطية والذي نحتفل اليوم بذكرى مرور ربع قرن على صدوره بالقاهرة عام 1997 آلية عمل ملهمة ودليلا دامغا على الدور البناء والإيجابي الذي يقوم به اتحادنا الموقر من أجل تدعيم قيم الديمقراطية باعتبارها مرتكزا رئيسيا وأساسيا للحكم الرشيد ومفهوما شاملا يهدف إلى صون وتعزيز كرامة الفرد وحقوقه الأساسية وتحقيق العدالة الاجتماعية ودعم التنمية الاقتصادية والاجتماعية وتعزيز الاستقرار المجتمعي والوطني بحيث شكلت قيم الديمقراطية ضمانة جادة لمشاركة الشعوب في صنع واتخاذ القرار ترسيخا لثلاثي الاستقرار الأمن المساواة التنمية وما يجعلنا كبرلمانيين بوصفنا صوت الشعب ومنابرها الحرة حريصين على التقييم الدائم والمستمر للديمقراطية وتنقيحها باستمرار من أجل معالجة أي عوار أو خلل يشوبها والنأي بها عن أي محاولات وممارسات استعلائية لقوليتها لقولبتها ووضعها في أطر جامدة دون مراعاة الخصوصية الثقافية للمجتمعات الزميلات العزيزات والزملاء الأعزاء لعلنا ونحن في هذه المناسبة أمام فرصة مثلى لمصارحة أنفسنا والمكاشفة للوصول إلى تقييم حقيقي وموضوعي الوضع الديمقراطية وتصحيح ومعالجة أوجه القصور التي ألمت بها عبر صياغة مقاربة شاملة تكون بمثابة دليل استرشادي لنا جميعا من أجل تعزيز قيم الديمقراطية وفي هذا الإطار ينبغي التأكيد على ضمان تطبيق الديمقراطية التشاركية التي تضمن عدالة تمثيل جميع فئات المجتمع دون إقصاء وهو ما يرسخ قيمتي المواطنة والتعايش السلمي باعتبارهما من قيم الديمقراطية التي تحفظ أمن المجتمعات واستقرارها 
كما توجد ضرورة ملحة للربط بين تحقيق التنمية الشاملة والمستدامة وتعزيز الديمقراطية ولكن على صعيد آخر تصطدم الديمقراطية بمحاولات البعض فرض مفاهيم وعادات دون مراعاة للخصوصية الثقافية والدينية لكل مجتمع فضلا عن غض الطرف عن حق الشعوب في تقرير مصيرها ومقاومة المحتل والتدخل في الشؤون الداخلية للدول وهو ما يجسد أسلوبا استعلائيا يضع قيم الديمقراطية على المحك ويعزز من مشاعر الفرقة والتباعد بين الشعوب بدلا من مد جسور الحوار والتعاون والتكامل الحضاري في وقت يجابه فيه عالمنا العديد من التحديات والتهديدات غير النمطية التي تفرض علينا أكثر من أي وقت مضى الانخراط في صيغ تعاونية جادة بيننا جميعا لمواجهتها ولم تأل الدولة المصرية جهدا من أجل دعم وتعزيز قيم الديمقراطية فصاغت مقاربة تصحيحية تستهدف مجابهة أي عوار أصاب جسد الديمقراطية وهما تجسد في العمل على إدماج جميع فئات المجتمع بتمثيل عادل في المؤسسات النيابية وضمان عدم إقصاء أي طرف خاصة على مستوى الشباب والمرأة وذوي الهمم وممثل المصريين بالخارج كما حرصت الدولة المصرية بكافة مؤسساتها على تحقيق معادلة تربط تحقيق التنمية بتعزيز الديمقراطية من خلال ضمان حصول الفئات الأولى بالرعاية على الخدمات الأساسية كاملة وتمكينهم من خلال العديد من المشاريع القومية وفي مقدمتها المشروع الرئاسي حياة كريمة والذي يستهدف إحداث طفرة تنموية شاملة للريف المصري والمجتمعات الأكثر احتياجا للارتقاء بالمستوى الاجتماعي والاقتصادي والخدمي لهم بما يضمن خلق مسار تنموي مستدام للمواطن المصري السيدات والسادة الحضور إننا وإذ نحتفل بتلك الذكرى الملهمة لصدور الإعلان العالمي للديمقراطية يجب علينا أن نتوقف بالمراجعة والمكاشفة لما آلت إليه الديمقراطية وما يشوب قيمها من بعض العوار فنحن البرلمانيين منابر الشعوب الحرة وصوتها الجسور الأولى بالتصدي والتصحيح لقيم الديمقراطية وإعادتها للمسار الصحيح حتى تظل الديمقراطية نموذجا فريدا للحكم الرشيد وألا يتم دفع دفعها في مسارات مغلوطة وخاطئة ولعل هذا هو بيت القصيد وما ترن إليه آمال وطموحات شعوبنا العظيمة التي نحمل جميعا أمانة تمثيلها وفي الختام أشكر حضراتكم شكرا جزيلا على المتابعة وحسن الاستماع
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And let me now turn to Mrs. Momal Vanian for the next remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gunila, and uh, happy International Day of Democracy, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you to the uh, International Interparliamentary Union for organizing this, this event. And it really is an honor to be part of such a distinguished uh, panel. So we meet here today, as has been said, to uh, mark the 25th anniversary of IPU's Declaration on Democracy and to reflect on whether uh, the Declaration is as young as it was and has stood the test of time. We ask ourselves, in fact, whether democracy is resilient and flexible enough to adapt to today's world and challenges. At first uh, glance, frankly, the picture is bleak. Uh, you have alluded to it, Gunilla. Democracy is in retreat and has been so globally in the last 15 years. So ironically, it has been uh, in retreat ever since the International Day of Democracy was proclaimed uh, at the in initiative, by the way, of, of Kofi Annan. So the, the rollback accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Trust in national and international uh, institutions, as well as in the ability of elections to deliver representatives and accountable government has decreased everywhere. And according to the latest report by one of our partners, the, the VDEM Institute, which is part of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, the level of democracy has uh, enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2021 um, was down to 1989 levels. So we now have fewer uh, democracies than when the declaration was adopted, unfortunately. And the trend is so pronounced that the Secretary General Guterres, Antonio Guterres, in his message for today, for this day, has uh, said very clearly, now is the time to raise the alarm. Uh, and I haven't heard that from him before. So turning to the multilateral system, uh, in the 1990s and the end of the Cold War, we saw a significant increase from all member states in the UN uh, of activities to promote democratization. In the 2000 Millennium Declaration, uh, UN member states committed together to, and I quote, spare no, sparing no effort to promote and strengthen democracy uh, and to strengthen the capacity of all countries to implement the principles and practices of democracy. But now we see that the focus of the international community in the multilateral system to promote democracy has waned over the past decade. Some countries have pushed back and arguing very reasonably that the issue of democracy has sometimes been used to further national narrow national interest. And I think uh, Speaker Gibali has spoken very clearly when he said that there is an air of superiority among some uh, that, has, uh, that has damaged, in fact, the cause of democracy. So it is uh, important to recall here uh, that the opening words of the UN Charter are we the people and they reflect the fundamental principle of democracy that the will of the people is the source of legitimacy of all sovereign states and of the UN itself. Uh, and the first principle of this document of the Universal Declaration on Democracy says that democracy, uh, democracy is a universally recognized ideal as well as goal, which is based on common values shared by people throughout the world community is irrespective of cultural, political, social, and economic differences. And the, in this vein, the UN is always very careful to say that it does not promote a specific, one specific model of government, 
but rather democratic governance as a set of values and, and, and principles, which are as important today as they were when the UN Charter was came into force in 1945 or when this declaration was adopted. However, so while the principle endures, we have to recognize that at the national level, there are significant challenges to the practice of democracy in today's society. And uh, President uh, Pacheco mentioned a few of them. One key issue is the fact that democracy has been unable to stem the rise of shocking inequalities. And another is the perceived lack of inclusivity and responsiveness of traditional political institutions and their incapacity to uh, bring in young people in particular. And the, the IPU always cites important figures regarding the fact that, you know, uh, while young people under 30 years of, of age comprise more than 50% of the global population, only 3% of parliamentarians worldwide are younger than 30. So this, this leads to diminishing, diminishing levels of confidence in democracy and electoral processes in general, and in young people in particular. And another, uh, another major challenge is the rapidly expanding grip of digital technologies. President Pacheco also mentioned it on the political, economic, and social spheres. And while these technologies can sometimes be favorable to democracy, for instance, by promoting uh, access to information, they also are securing voter registers, for instance. They also pose a clear threat because of their detrimental impact on social cohesion and on trust, as we've seen in many elections recently. So the Kofi Annan Foundation uh, established a few years ago, Kofi Annan himself, before he passed, a commission on elections and democracy in the digital age that came up with important recommendations with regard to uh, to social to the impact of social media on elections and regulations for online political advertising. And it's clear that urgent action is needed in that, in that field. So democratic institutions therefore need to be much more plugged in, uh, capable of harnessing new technologies themselves for the good and to counter their nefarious effects. Uh, what is unchanged is clearly people's aspirations to democracy. There isn't a single person, if you go around the world and you ask them, do you want an accountable, transparent, representative, legitimate, effective government who will say no. No one will say no. And in fact, surveys after surveys show that around the world, 80% uh, of people say democracy is, democracy is important to have. This has been very steady over the last 25 years since the declaration was, was accepted. So to respond to these emergency, emerging challenges to democracy, such as the use of the digital technologies or social inequalities, we must all step up our efforts and work together to restore, to restore trust in democratic processes. We need to recognize that uh, some, while some of the challenges are, are similar across democracies and across countries, they can be different democratic solutions in different societies. So we need to highlight the best practices from wherever they come from. And I will stop here, but I really want to thank uh, IPU again for organizing this important event. Thank you. Thank you very much. You made very many good <laughs> points and thank you for your sharp observations. <laughs> now I'm happy to turn to Her Excellency Al Mufta. The floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thanks, Mr. Martin, for giving me this uh, opportunity to be part of this uh, session and happy International Democ Democracy Day. Um, I would like also to, uh, to stress the important role played by IPU in promoting democratic practices, culture, and values over the last uh, uh, decades. And also um, um, the, the, the stress, sorry, stress the strong ties between Qatar Shura Council and IPU where Qatar hosted the 140 General Assembly meeting. Uh, in Qatar 2017, uh, sorry, 19. Now, if I may uh, turn into Arabic, because unfortunately my speech was written in Arabic, um, I can translate, but it's gonna be, take some time consuming. So um, let me start in Arabic, please, okay. 
السيدات والسادة الحضور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله لا شك أن الذكرى الخامسة والعشرون للإعلان العالمي للديمقراطية تمثل محطة مهمة في مسيرة العمل الديمقراطي العالمي وذلك لما تضمنه هذا الإعلان من مبادئ لا زالت سارية المفعول وتشكل مرتكزات أساسية لتعزيز الديمقراطية كالاستقرار وتحقيق التنمية ولكن الحديث عن الديمقراطية وإشكالاتها كما رأينا من قبل المتحدثين ومن خلال الفيديوهات المعروضة والأسئلة التي تطرحها كانت وستظل دائما تساؤلات دائمة ومستمرة ومتجددة وستستمر الجدليات حول سبل تكييف النظام الديمقراطي مع خصوصية كل تجربة على حدة فالديمقراطية بناء دائم التشكل والتغيير قابل للترميم والتعديل والإصلاح رقم قدم أسسه النظرية وتراكم مبادئه المؤطرة والموجهة وتعدد سياقه التشريعية وفي هذا الإطار الجدلي يفرض السؤال نفسه حول السؤال الذي تم طرحه في البداية ما هي الديمقراطية؟ هل الديمقراطية تتحدث عن ديمقراطية المواطنة والانتخابات؟ أم هي ديمقراطية النظام والمرتبطة بتأسيس قواعد الإدارة العامة؟ أم هي ديمقراطية الحكم الجيد؟ أغلب الدراسات والتجارب الناجحة تشير إلى أن الأزمات المختلفة تثبت يوما بعد يوم أن الحكم الجيد من خلال تضافر جهود وتعاون السلطات هو الممارسة المثلى لديمقراطية القرن الحالي والتي تشهد العديد من المهددات والتحديات ستظل الديمقراطية في عالمنا المليء بالكثير من التحديات السياسية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية والبيئية مهددة في معظم أنحاء عالمنا لهذا فأن تحصين التجارب الديمقراطية من هذه المهددات المتلاحقة والمتجددة قد يعد هو أفضل السبل لمواجهة تحديات مختلفة مثل النزاعات المسلحة، انتشار التطرف، الإرهاب، العنف، العنصرية، عدم التمثيل المتوازن للمرأة والشباب، الأزمات الاقتصادية والمالية والبيئية كالتغير المناخي وأزمة كوفيد-19. إن استمرار مثل هذه المهددات يتطلب استجابة ديمقراطية عاجلة للتصدي لها الآن ربما أكثر من أي وقت مضى. لذلك فإن الحفاظ على إصالة الممارسات الديمقراطية ودعمها أمر لا قناع عنه لتعزيز صمود المجتمعات ودعم قدرتها على المواجهة والتعافي. واسمحوا لي هنا أن أستشهد بتجربة أو بأزمتين وتحديين مرت بهما الديمقراطية خلال السنتين الماضيتين. أزمة كوفيد 19 مثلت اختبارا حقيقيا للعديد من الديمقراطيات في اتخاذ اجراءات توازن بين ضروره الوقايه من الوباء والحد من انتشاره واهميه الحفاظ على الحقوق والحريات الاساسيه. في الوقت الذي ابرزت فيه الجائحه العديد العديد من مظاهر التآزر والتضامن بين الدول والشعوب الا انه الا انها كشفت عن اوجه التفاوت وعدم المساواه والظلم وهضم الحقوق. ولا سيما فيما يتعلق بجهود الاستجابة الدولية الصحية والاقتصادية العاجلة للتصدي للوباء. لهذا وجد أن الآلية الديمقراطية لبعض التجارب لم تكن قادرة بشكل فعال وسريع على احتواء الأزمة الوبائية مما دفع بعض الديمقراطيات للأسف إلى ممارسة بعض السلوكيات التي لا تنتمي نهائيا إلى منظومة الفكر الديمقراطي أما بالنسبة للتغير المناخي فقد شهدنا جميعا مؤخرا الكثير من الكوارث الطبيعية التي أنهكت شعوبها وشعوب الدول المتضررة سياسيا واقتصاديا واجتماعيا فكوارث التغير المناخي ترتبط بعدة تداعيات تتعلق بتحقيق أهداف التنمية الزراعة، صيد الأسماك، الحصول على الطاقة، الإنتاج، الصحة، الأمن الغذائي والأمن المائي وما يترتب عليه من فقر وبطالة ومجاعة إلى آخر من القضايا تثير الانتباه إلى أن تغير المناخ مهدد عميق وواسع ودائم ما لم يكن هناك حراك ديمقراطي عاجل يشمل تشريعات لتغير المناخ وتصبح جزء من إطار سياسة ديمقراطية أوسع وأشمل تعزز التنمية العادلة والمستدامة الشاملة من ناحية أخرى تتعدد نماذج الأنظمة الحاكمة في العالم ولكل دولة لها الحق السيادي في اختيار ما تراه مناسبا من نظم سياسية واجتماعية إلى آخرة التي تتوافق مع رغبات شعوبها وسياقاتها الوطنية وخصوصياتها ولكن تبقى المبادئ الأساسية المتعلقة بالحكم الرشيد والشفافية والنزاهة كما تفضل بها دكتور حنفي وسيادة حكم القانون واحترام وحماية حقوق الإنسان قيما اساسيه لا قناع عنها لتحقيق الاستمرار والتنميه وتقديم الشعوب وتقدم الشعوب. 
العالم اليوم لم عفوا ان العالم لم يكن في اي وقت من اوقات بحاجه للتضامن وتعزيز القيم الديمقراطيه اكثر من اليوم. اليوم نتطلب ان ان يتقلب صوت الانسانيه والحكمه للمحافظه على المكتسبات التنمويه. واسمحوا لي ان اعرج سريعا على بلدي. لقد خطت دولة قطر خطوات متقدمة في إيجار جهودها الوطنية لتعزيز حماية حقوق الإنسان وترسيخ بناء دولة القانون من خلال تعزيز المشاركة الشعبية في السلطة التشريعية وفي صنع القرار ولقد جرت في شهر أكتوبر من 2021 أول انتخابات تشريعية لاختيار أعضاء مجلس الشورى وشهدت هذه الانتخابات أقبالا مجتمعيا كبيرا وقد باشر مجلس الشورى منذ نوفمبر الماضي بمسؤولياتهم ومهامهم كسلطة تشريعية وكذلك تفخر دولة قطر بما حققته من إنجازات في مجالات تعزيز الديمقراطية النزاهة والشفاهية الشفافية ومكافحة الفساد والوقاية منه تجسدت عمليا في افتتاح المكتب المنظمة العالمية للبرلمانية ضد الفساد في يونيو 2021 السيدات والسادة ونحن نتطلع لاستضافة نهائيات كأس كرة العالم كأس العالم لكرة القدم في دولة قطر بنهاية هذا العام كلنا ثقة بأن هذه الفعاليات الرياضية ستكون فرصة ممتازة لتعزيز الممارسات والقيم الديمقراطية التي تدعو إلى إها الرياضة وعلى رأسها قيم المساواة والعدالة والنزاهة وترسيخ قيم احترام الآخرين والتسامح وتخطي اختلاف الثقافات لقد أثبتت الرياضة أنها أداة فعالة التكلفة ومرنة لتعزيز أهداف السلام والتنمية وهذا ما تسعى له الديمقراطية في الختام أشكركم مرة أخرى وأتمنى لهذه الجلسة والاتحاد البرلماني كل التوفيق Thank you very much uh, Her Excellency for your very interesting points and observations and now let me turn to um, Mr. Secretary General, Mr. Chungong, for your remarks. Please, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ganila. Uh, thank you for uh, moderating this uh, very important uh, meeting. And let me use the opportunity to uh, wish, uh, like every speaker before me, wish all our audience out there happy day, uh, International Day of Democracy. Uh, I would like to use the opportunity to, to thank uh, His Excellency Dr. Hanafi El uh, Gebali for traveling all the way from Cairo to be with us here. And uh, I think that it is a befitting tribute to the foundational uh, instrument that was adopted in this country. And uh, uh, we can really be saying that uh, in this respect, uh, uh, Egypt, in a way, was uh, is the cradle of the IPU's uh, uh, Universal Declaration on Democracy. I thank my colleague sitting at the other end of the table, Corinne, for being there for us all the time mm -hmm. and uh, for working stringently with all of us to improve upon uh, democracy uh, worldwide, as well as other areas of endeavor. And today, as has I, I let me not forget the uh, online participant, uh, my good friend, Dr. Uh, Mr. Pacheco, I hope he's still online, just to say uh, happy International Day of Democracy, Duarte, wherever you are. Uh, we really consider this day a special day for all of us uh, because we celebrate uh, what is very close to our hearts, democracy, I think. We've all said that uh, democracy, we can't do without democracy, at least that's what I've heard here. I do agree uh, with that. and. If, uh, as uh, Secretary General of this institution, I am particularly proud that uh, we are seen as promoting uh, something that has uh, global recognition and legitimacy. And as been pointed out, and the logo behind there says, we work for democracy for everyone, which means that we are there to extol the virtues of inclusiveness in whatever political dispensation we uh, put in place. We at the IPU therefore have uh, democracy as uh, part of our DNA. And today, as uh, Dr. Uh, Hanafi was saying, uh, it is an opportunity for us to assess where we are with our democracy. And uh, it is important so that we can then uh, use that as an opportunity to build forward uh, better. 
And to do that assessment, uh, I think many of the speakers before me have mentioned the challenges that democracy is facing. Uh, let me start for my part with some of the good stories. Over uh, recent years, we have witnessed uh, a growing increase in the percentage of women in representative institutions, especially uh, parliaments. And uh, we can really say that uh, there has been progress, although that progress is not uh, fast enough. Today, as we celebrate, I want to uh, celebrate and call out some uh, countries that are showing the light when it comes to democracy, where women are uh, representing 50% or more of the parliamentary seats. And uh, I would like to mention countries like Mexico, Nicaragua, Cuba, Rwanda, and the United Arab Emirates. And that is those countries that in 2022 are actually uh, recording uh, more women in parliament than men. By the same token, we see that parliaments are also gradually being rejuvenated. We're having more young people in parliament. And when we look at the statistics that we have available at the IPU, we see that uh, parliamentarians, young parliamentarians under 45 years of age have increased in numbers to close to 30%. But when you go down the age ladder, the story is not that uh, bright because we see that parliamentarians under the age of 30 account for just 2.6% of uh, the uh, parliamentary seats around the, around the world. It is true that a few years ago, that representation was under 2%. So there has been some progress there. And we have countries like Norway that are, are shining the light in this particular area. Norway stands today to be the youngest uh, parliament in the world. And uh, we salute, we salute uh, Norway just as we salute Armenia. We also salute uh, Serbia for showing how we can make parliament younger. Of course, as I have said, a lot still has to be done. And we have all said here that democracy is under assault, is under attack, is challenged. You can have any manner of uh, words to characterize the state of democracy uh, today. But when we look at those challenges, we think, and we this morning I had in the Human Rights Council, that we need to transform challenges into opportunities. So these challenges should only spur us to do better as uh, democracies al a democracy allows us uh, to do. We look at challenges such as backsliding and democracy, we, in recent years, we have seen an increase in the number of coup d'etats in the world, something we had thought had been relegated to the past, but uh, we see many countries uh, experiencing coup d'etats. And this has given, uh, I, I would say, uh, a pretext to people to preach populism in our communities, extremism. I think you mentioned it, Madam Ambassador. And uh, there is an increasing rise in autocracy. So uh, we also have noticed Unfortunately, that the number of parliaments functioning in the world today used to be 100, uh, no, it used to be 193. Today, we have lost three because of uh, political uh, challenges. And during these uh, discussions today, you'll be hearing from representatives of some countries that have experienced uh, challenges in terms of uh, the subversion of democratic practices, uh, including in Myanmar. Um, I think the point has been made that democracy is fragile because there are these challenges and you know it's like boxing people get at you and they're hitting you all the time but the beauty of democracy and all of us are saying that and today as the 25th anniversary of the universal declaration of democracy the beauty of democracy is that it is like the phoenix it will always rise from its ashes it is resilient it is because it is legitimate and uh, Corinne, you did make the point that uh, there is nobody who, who would today openly challenge the validity or legitimacy of democracy. So there is something that the most uh, democracy has going for it, and we need to nurture that. Let me go back to what uh, President Pacheco said, and he used that analogy of a flower. The flower that would wither, dry out if you don't water it. And I think that is what we need to do, and that is why we are here uh, today, 
We do have the instrument that can help us do this, the Universal Declaration on Democracy, which has, I think, 27 items there, how we see democracy progressing. And that declaration in 1998 in Cairo actually says that it is based, democracy is based on a system of shared values. It is the best system uh, that we have in terms of uh, governance. It came at a time, this declaration came at a time when there was a lot of hope being invested in new processes following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Iron Curtain, and many countries were coming to the fore and aspiring to more freedom, human rights, and what have you. And we think that today we need to not dash the hopes of those people way back in in 1989, 1990, and then, uh, thereafter. The good news for us is that parliaments, like they did during the pandemic, have not given up. They are resilient, like democracy itself. And when you look at the countries where parliaments have really been under attack, Guinea, Sudan, Sudan, well, Sudan, Guinea, Mali, uh, Chad, these countries in spite of the fact that the military coup leaders have uh, dissolved parliament, they have sought to put in place some form of legislative government. And that is what is important, showing that parliaments are indispensable to uh, good governance, a good uh, to democracy. And I quote the former uh, speaker of uh, the Na uh, National Assembly of uh, France, Philippe Seguin, he said there can be no democracy without parliaments, just as there can be no parliament without democracy. So we today celebrate the resilience of parliaments. We do hope that we can all come together today in greater resolve to engage the citizens so that they have uh, a say in how uh, democratic processes uh, unfold. Let me conclude by saying uh, that, uh, well, rather asking the question, so if democracy is failing today, do we abandon democracy? I don't think so. I have said that there's a lot going for democracy. What we need to do is to improve upon it. Maybe its processes, but not its principles, the foundational principles and values, but the way it is practiced. We cannot throw out the baby with the bathwater. We just need to make sure that that baby uh, survives. So let me then conclude, uh, Ganila, by saying, that if there's anything that democracy can do for us, democracy should be made to deliver for the people. And the word people has been expressed several times here in this meeting. Democracy has to meet the expectations of the people. And those expectations are very clear down to earth. They aspire to better well-being. They aspire to development. They aspire to peace. They aspire to access to health and education, all of that. And I think that it is within the powers of democracy and parliaments to deliver on these expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chungong. Um, and thank you all here at the panel for interesting, very pertinent, pertinent Remarks, interesting observations. Let me just follow up with a couple of questions to you panelists. Um, and I guess the, the main question is how valid this declaration on democracy is. We, as we heard, Corinne was saying, we have fewer democracies today than when the declaration was adopted. Um, there is a lack of engagement with political decisions. More and more people are actually abstaining from voting. So let me ask this question to you, Mr. Chungong. How valid is this declaration today? I, uh, in my tra various travels and uh, uh, contributions to the debate uh, nationally and internationally, I'm yet to see somebody who has challenged the validity of this declaration. Uh, the thing is, in, because that declaration puts on paper, and that was the first time it was happening, the component ingredients of a democracy. What are the hallmarks of the democratic system of governance? And 
We are all agreed about that. And I think uh, Corinne said it very well. The speaker from Egypt did, said, we all aspire to peace, uh, prosperity, and it's democracy that allows this to happen. The document, the declaration uh, extols the virtues of human rights. And what is very important in there is that for the first time, uh, uh, um, maybe we should pat ourselves on the back, the global community was looking at democracy, not only in terms of democracy at the national level, but also at the international level. It was the first time that this, such a declaration was saying that yes, you can hold member states individually in their countries to uphold democracy, but also the international system of governance has to be democratic. And that is what we are saying today. I think everybody is saying today that if multilateralism is failing, one of the factors for this is because it is not inclusive. It does not respond to the real needs of the people. And so we think that this declaration uh, is, was an eye opener it continues to be valid because all of those questions in there today are still d'actualité, as they say in French. And so for me, it is at once valid and legitimate. Mm, yes, but one of the issues we discussed here, one is the, the lack of, of women uh, in the democratic process and also the lack of youth. And you mentioned, Corinne, that 50% uh, of the world's population is under 30, but I think it's barely 3% of all the MPs that are under 30. So how, how serious is this? What implications does this have? And what to do about it? How are we gonna get more young people to be involved in politics and political decision-making? Thanks, Gunilla. And I really think that's very, very important because it, it is a serious matter. All surveys show that young people abstain more than their elder, that they trust their institutions less. Uh, in countries with solid democratic institutions, young people take those institutions for granted or don't even know them. So there is, there is a, a, a global issue. So there are many things that can and should be done. One is, first of all, and I, I talked to a young activist on this issue just last week, and she said very clearly, uh, young people who have the right to vote should have the right to run for office. So we have to lower the legislative barriers to running for office. If you have the right to vote, you should be able to run for office as well. There are many legislation that still bar young people for running from, from different offices. Uh, so uh, one of the members of our board, in fact, of the, of the Kofi Annan Foundation, Samson Itodo from Nigeria, he ran a very effective campaign in Nigeria, which was called Not Too Young to Run. And he managed to change to have the law that, you know, the campaign managed to have the law changed to lower the age of, uh, of, of being uh, eligible. So that's one thing. Uh, the, the second thing is, um, what would help, and young people tell us that, is to have uh, constitutional term limits. Because if you have the same head of state or the same parliamentarians there for 30, 40 years, obviously, first of all, that's going to be a barrier to younger people coming into, into office. Uh, even, but also it just, it just demotivates young voters if it's the same old faces that they see up there all the time. Three, the political parties have a role to play uh, first of all, the political parties often misuse their youth wings, and we've seen it. They, instead of using them to educate the future leaders, making sure that uh, they instill the sense of, uh, of duty, political service to the public service, uh, political, uh, ethical uh, behavior, and so on, they sometimes use the, the youth wing as, as militias, frankly sometimes, and that's, that can be a, a real problem. Um, the, the fourth is that uh, we know that young people, it's not that they're not interested in, in the big challenges of today. They are very concerned. They are cause-driven, they're not process-driven. So somehow our political parties, our governments, our parliaments have to be able to show they work on causes, not on processes. So it's really important. And climate change, we've talked about it, the end of discrimination. Young people are very committed, interested, active. However, 
you know they uh, they don't they they don't believe that our government is our democratic institutions deal with these causes. Uh, the fifth way I think is civic education, which has been forgotten in many countries. Uh, many young people just do not know how a parliament works and the importance of explaining the importance of parliament and legislative processes that you know this is how the law works why we have a higher chamber of parliament why we have a lower chamber of parliament how that works how low you know this is really important but young people sometimes don't know so i think reinst reintegrating uh, civic education in basic education in school is really important for people just to know what's going on and why they should uh, why they should vote and why they should care mm -hmm. I think one uh, one last issue, maybe one last way, is we have seen that those parliaments, in particular, that use uh, uh, the new technologies for platforms of engagement, discussions online with young people, those are successful in reaching out because these are, these are the platforms that young people are, are are familiar with and comfortable with. So I think there's a number of things that can be done and should be done to re-engage young people into democratic processes. Mm, interesting. You make you give many many good examples, mm. and and there's a lot to do there. Mm. I would like to give here the floor to His Excellency Speaker Gibali on this issue. Thank you very much. I speak in Arabic. Then put the headphones. وثمن جدا كلمة السيدة مومل فانيان حول مشاركة الشباب في العمل السياسي وبالذات في البرلمان. نحن في مصر هناك طفرة غير عادية فقد انتخب الشباب في البرلمان المصري بنسبة لم يسبق لها مثيل نسبة 33% من البرلمان المصري أي الثلث من الشباب وكان هذا نتيجة لسياسة الدولة المصرية في تشجيع الشباب على المشاركة السياسية والمجتمعية فالدستور المصري نص على أن الانتخاب بالاقتراع الحر المباشر القيادة السياسية في مصر هي أول من بادر على مستوى العالم بعقد المؤتمر الدولي للشباب فيه يجتمع جميع شباب العالم سنويا ويدلوا بدلوهم ويبدو جميع آراء آراءهم وطموحاتهم في هذا المؤتمر العالمي فمصر تشهد طفرة في تشجيع الشباب فضلا عن أن المرأة في البرلمان المصري وأيضا بالانتخاب الحر المباشر تبلغ نسبتها 28% من مجموع عدد النواب هذا يدل على أن هناك اتجاه تقدمي واضح نحو تمكين كل من الشباب والمرأة الانتخاب في مصر يتم بصورة مباشرة أنا كنت قاضي سابق رئيس للمحكمة الدستورية العليا وخضت الانتخابات وأنا لا أعلم يقينا إن كنت سوف أفوز أم لا أفوز هذا شيء طبيعي فوجئت بالفوز ثم داخل البرلمان تشجعت أكثر للترشح لرئاسة البرلمان المصري وقد دخلت هذه الانتخابات بصفتي مستقل لا أنتمي لأي حزب وفوجئت بثقة النواب ربما لأني قاضي سوف أحكم بينهم بالعدل ربما فأرجو توضيح هذه النقطة مصر تطبق جميع معايير الديمقراطية حاليا لا تحاسبوننا عن الماضي أنا أتحدث عن الحاضر مصر حاليا لديها تكوين برلماني قائم على الانتخاب الحر من يحضر من حضراتكم داخل البرلمان المصري يرى المعارضة القوية جدا من أحزاب معارضة الشباب يعارض بقوة حتى يغضب منا بعض السادة الوزراء يغضبوا بشدة من قوة المعارضة فقد يكون السبب أن نحن لا نسوق أنفسنا ولكن العهد الحالي يقوم على تطبيق معايير الديمقراطية بدءا من الانتخابات الحرة 
تحت إشراف قضائي عادل جدا وتحت الإشراف الدولي ثم الممارسة السياسية نفسها من حرية التعبير في جميع المجالات وأحزاب المعارضة كذلك تبدي رأيها بحرية أما ما قد يصار عن كما أشارت السيدة موما الفانيان في كلمتها القيمة عن أن من مبادئ الديمقراطية عدم تجنيب أو إبعاد أي صاحب رأي هذه مسألة تتعلق بطبيعة المجتمع المصري نحن لا نجنب أحد ولكن تخيلوا معي تجربة أفغانستان أنا أتحدث صراحة وبقلب مفتوح عن تجربة الإسلام السياسي أنا مسلم ولكن الإسلام السياسي مرفوض على مستوى العالم لأنه قد يجلب كثير من المحن والمصائب لكل شعوب الأرض الإسلام السياسي ليس هو الإسلام وليست مبادئ الإسلام الأصلية التي تكمن في قلوبنا كمسلمين إذا لا نتحدث عن إبعاد طائفة هذه طائفة تتبنى اتجاهات معادية للإنسانية ولذلك لفظها الشعب المصري في يوم 30 يونيو خرج خرج الشعب المصري كاملا حتى سدت الشوارع وأزاعها التلفزيون وأزاعتها وسائل الإعلام لرفض هذا الاتجاه بعد أن فشل خلال عام واحد في إدارة نظام الحكم على أساس ديمقراطي سليم وإنما أقحم مبادئ هي بعيدة عن الإسلام وتقترب من الإرهاب بالمعنى الواضح فهذا الذي انتهجوه كان سيسبب الآلام للبشرية جميعا أنا أتحدث بمنتهى الصراحة حين تحدثت أن الديمقراطية وليدة ظروف كل دولة كنت أتحدث بصراحة عن هذا أنتم في أوروبا لا تتخيلون مدى ما كنا نعانيه في هذه الفترة هذه المعاناة كانت قاسية جدا ومصر بلدي وطني تصدت لهذه المصائب منعت عن العالم كله تفشي الإرهاب ثم منعنا كذلك ممارسات أخرى قد تؤدي إلى الأسوأ فأنا أطمنكم بحكم أنني قاضي ولا أعرف سوى العدالة أن الديمقراطية في مصر تسود حاليا وبمنتهى العدالة والصدق شكرا جزيلا Thank you Thank you very much. Interesting to hear and encouraging to hear about youth and women in, in Egypt. Uh, so thank you very much, Adna. This topic is, is um, engaging, I can see. And I would now like to turn back to Mr. Chungong, who also has some, some points on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to pick up on what uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jabali has just said about young people. And let me commend Egypt and you, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, on your very good record when it comes to uh, youth representation in parliament. I can uh, concur that uh, uh, we youth actually represented the 3% in the parliament. And uh, 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 similarly with uh, women, I, I, remember, I remember several years ago, uh, I think uh, women's representation was something like two, 3% in parliament. And today it has increased tenfold, that's fine. I come back to what I said about democracy being practiced at the national and the international level. At the international level in the ITU, uh, we want to show that we practice what we preach. And that is why if you look at the uh, image of the IPU today, it is more gender sensitive. It is more youth oriented, the younger and younger people coming into the IPU youth uh, 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 deliberations. And we do have a vibrant youth forum which is bringing in new ideas, using new technologies to articulate their views. It is something that we would like other organizations to uh, take borrow relief from. And the women's movement, of course, has been there for 50 years and is very strong. And what has happened is that we have instituted a system of sanctions for those who defaulting parliament, as well as premiums for those who are doing well. For instance, when you have more young uh, members of your delegation, you have more speaking time. So there are things that we're doing as an international organization to practice democracy at the international level that 
complement what is being done by the uh, member states in terms of uh, uh, actually rolling out the principles and values of health and the democracy declaration. Mm. Thank you. Also interesting points that you raised there. Uh, now we would love to hear from our audiences, both here in Geneva and also uh, from the hundreds that are online. Uh, we will take a moment uh, now to play a short video so you can enter your questions in the Q&A function on the Zoom. And at this point, we also have to bid farewell, unfortunately, to His Excellency Speaker, Mr. Gibali who has to leave us for another engagement. But thank you so much for, for your good points and interesting observations that you shared with us. Thank you so much. So um, let's now continue. Welcome back to the IPU studio in Geneva. We're very happy to still have our distinguished panelists and participants with us. And I would like to start now as we continue with a question to Her Excellency Al Mufta uh, about gender parity. We were speaking about how there's a lack of youth in politics and parliaments. There's also a lack of women in many parliaments. So what is the biggest issue problem and how could this be solved? Are quotas, for example, the right way to go to change this or are there other ways that we haven't tried before? Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I would like to start with, with one fact if I may to do so uh, whenever discussing any gender issues. Women, um, I would always say that they are the wealth and power of any society. If neglected or not utilized effectively in any development process of any society, it means that uh, either this development process misled or lagging behind uh, at some stages. 
So uh, answering your question, um, it's not an easy to answer, the, I mean, the gender, the gender question. Because when talking about women, we are talking about the whole structural and systematic, uh, you know, um, policies, legislation, uh, procedures, even to some point, even the culture itself and how it will affect the promotion of women and democracy and parliament's uh, practices. But basically, I think it should start from the leadership um, support itself, whether, whether the political leadership, they really believe um, in women's empowerment and women's added value to the economy and to the society development uh, aspects. And also, if this is, I mean, if number one, specifically I'm talking about our experience where we are coming from the GCC countries, we used to be very conservative societies, but it's not anymore uh, within such situation. So we, if, when having, I mean, most of the successful experiences we are witnessing today in the GCC, it's because of the belief and commitment of the political leadership in the powerful role played by women in, in, the, in, democracy, in, in, democracy, in the democracy in general. So having said that, uh, definitely, I believe strongly that education is number one. Education, it's an, it's an agent uh, tool to change a lot of uh, cultural, societal, societal um, things. Uh, once education in a place, investment, uh, get the rate of return, then we are talking about legislation, whether it is within constitutions, whether it is with legal system, whether it is even when, when uh, human resources are friendly, uh, family and, and women uh, gender policies and uh, procedures. And then we have to talk also about the awareness of the society and how such awareness among the society itself, I'm talking culturally and society, can be part in promoting women's role in, in general. Um, and this is why am I saying this? Because in some uh, um, uh, social um, societies, unfortunately, you will find that even today, I mean, I can find it even in most democratic uh, you know, societies where culture sometimes, because of the stereotype and because of the other related issues to women, they always, it is not really a practice in a very, I would say, efficient and effective uh, way. And number, uh, I mean, finally, it will come to, to women itself, whether they are interested as, I think Monishi was mentioned something that some of them are not interested, and being an active part of uh, within uh, women participation in the democracy. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. And yeah, there, are, there are hopeful things that you actually can do. And I think you're right. Education is really the key to start from early on, and then that give place to to more women to actually have a space in the political sphere. Um, now, <clears throat> I'm happy to invite Mr. Nunt from Myanmar. Mr. Nunt is the head of the committee representing the Myanmar parliament that was elected in November 2020 before the military coup in February 2021. So we will now have, if I write a video statement from Mr. Nunt. Excellency, Mr. President. Honorable Mr. Secretary General, Governing Council, esteemed speakers, parliamentary colleges, and IPU family. Minalawa, on behalf of the CRPH and through it, all MPs and those we re represent, deep appreciation for giving me the floor to comment the perilous situation in Myanmar. I begin by responding to the IPU's title question. Has the IPU declaration on democracy stood the test of time? The answer can only be yes. People defend democracy when it is under threat. The peoples of Myanmar are doing that each and every day at great risk to their liberty and lives. Today is a day when we celebrate democracy and acts as a reminder to do this every day of the year. We parliamentarians can best do this in our parliaments by ensuring that the five core values 
articulated through the IPU uh, enshrined in all parliamentary architecture. We, the CRPH and e parliament, strive to inculcate these five core values. Representative, we are. Having been elected on November 2020 in a free and fair election, and we respond to our constituents' needs, indeed in extreme conditions. Open and transparent we are. Having convened the Union Parliament four times, and active in all forms of media, given many of us had to flee and face horror if culture captured, with many MPs having suffered this fate. Accessible, accountable, and effective we are. In that, we maintain our duties as representatives, legislators, and provide oversight to the NUG and its administration. Myanmar has a tradition of self correction expressed in Parliament as continuous improvement. The IBU states the only political system with capacity for self correction is a democratic one. This alone makes democracy a fundamental governance principle. The very first, very first civilian government since 1962, led by State Councillor Do Aung San Suu Kyi, conducted a free and fair election in 2020 November with a diverse array of candidates. Dear colleges, 19 months ago, the military Honda under May outline attempted an illegal and failing coup. 19 months for May outline's brutal military Honda to murder 2,234 people, some children, seized and detained over 11,000 people, subject many to interrogation, rape, torture, Military courts to impose lengthy sentences under the order of one man may arrive. He alone has brought our country to its knees. It is now an economic budget piece while he plunders state owned resources. Many more have fled their homes and thousands are displaced in jungle and on the border. Due to crucial actions by the military founder, that includes aerial bombings. Several state leaders and democrat democracy activists, including the Wang San Suu Kyi, are languishing in goals, facing trumpet up charges. We are defending and maintaining democracy while we are facing serious and heinous human rights violations. The military Honda is now trying to hold an election, desire to have them hold, but no wind power. This election cannot be recognized. It is an assault on the people, an assault on democracy. Dear parliamentary colleges, I, on behalf of all elected members of Myanmar parliament and the people we represent, seek your continued support and I, I ask you on this auspicious day to one big thing, that is, pass a resolution in your respective parliaments that recognizes the CRPH as a legitimate and lawful parliament that it indeed is. And in the same resolution that you will form your Myanmar parliamentary friendship group with the CRPH. Please support us in our work to reclaim and rebuild our democracy so that civilian government reveals 
and we can create the constitutional federal democracy we crave to bring peace to our many peoples. Thank you, IPU, for all that you stand for and act upon us. Um, thank you. This was a very, very strong and important uh, speech, I think. Uh, and I'd just like to follow up uh, with Korean your thoughts here. Um, um, Mr. Nguyen saying is that the elect planned elections are an assault on democracy is one of the things he's mentioning. What are your thoughts around this? Well, I mean, I think the situation of in 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 Myanmar is is of is of very great concern because the level of violence is undiminished, and there doesn't seem to be a now, you know, a solution uh, inside. The the case of Myanmar was one of these uh, several cases, very striking that made 2021 a disastrous year for, for democracy with the coup in, uh, in, in Yangon. It's the, the, the junta thought they could just go back to the 1980s. What is very interesting, however, is that many considered that in a way it's a failed coup because the people rose, the people would have lived through democracy and did not want to go back to what the situation was before. Now, of course, the, the position of the international community uh, uh, is, uh, is evolving. So far, the, uh, the, the government in Yangon has not been recognized for, by the United Nations. There will be a discussion in a few days for the 77th session of the General Assembly on which delegation to recognize through the credential committees of the United Nations. That will be a very in, interesting indication of whether the international community stands firm with uh, with the junta, but the situation is of great concern. There is there is violence, there is systematic oppression, and a solution has to be found. And of course, elections held in this context would have no credibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Important points, and uh, there's a lot to do there. And as you said, very important to stay firm now. Uh, let me go to an intervention we have online from the Swedish Per Arne Håkansson, Swedish parliamentarian. So uh, please go ahead, Mr. Håkansson. We say that uh, human rights, the enjoyment of human rights is part and parcel of democracy. And in the IPU, we have a mechanism where we investigate uh, uh, cases of violation of human rights of parliamentarians. And we call out the authorities that perpetrate uh, violations against uh, the integrity of, uh, members, of uh, members of parliament. This is a way that we uh, are able to hold our member states, our member parliaments accountable for those uh, values and principles that they have signed up to. When we say that we want more youth in parliament, then we want to make sure that delegations coming to the IPU are young. And so there is a premium for uh, those that bring young parliamentarians. Same thing with women. Uh, women parliamentarians uh, who come to the IPU, if, if, uh, they, if every delegation, every delegation has to be gender equal. And uh, those that don't come with gender equal delegations lose part of their entitlements in the IPU. So in a way, we are 
working towards applying sanctions or actually enforcing what we uh, preach. Of course, we are not uh, the gendarmes of this world. We cannot just go after each member state or member parliament and tell them that uh, you are in violation of this. Please get back on track. But then we can appeal to the, the moral conscience. We can, uh, uh, I would say, name and shame. We can show that other parliaments are doing good things that need to be emulated according to the uh, precepts of the Universal Declaration on Democracy. So if you ask me the question, we're not there to enforce standards, we're there to help apply them according to a system that has been owned, has been seen to be owned by the entire, entire membership of the IP. Yeah, good points. Um, let me just see if we have Mr. Hawkinson. I don't think we, we do, but we had had very many interesting observations and points, and we heard some very, very pertinent remarks from our panelists today. And uh, now we're going to wrap up. It is five o'clock. And uh, I, I think we discussed a lot about how there is a recession in democracy and so forth. But we also heard a lot of hopeful stories, I think, from you, Corinne, from Egypt, uh, from uh, Martin Chogong, and also from the, the Minister of Qatar, so, or the Ambassador of Qatar. So there is a lot of hope. And I think what we have to hope for is more youth, more youth involvement in politics, more women. Uh, we have to hope that there's going to be less abstentions. That's also a trend that's quite worrying. And not least, what we hadn't really had time to talk about a lot is the importance of democracy in climate change and in fighting global warming. Uh, here, a strengthened democracy can really play a role. Just think that we already have almost 3,000 climate-related laws. That shows how important it is. So uh, on, with those notes, I would like to conclude and thank you very much, our panelists, and uh, looking forward to see you again in one year when we again celebrate Universal Declaration on Democracy. Thank you. <laughs>